that day, but I, rem- I don't know why, I just remember passages, and, it, and I, I call it self-talk because I talk to myself, there's nobody else there when I'm asleep, and, well, Barbara, but you know what I mean. I'm wrapped up by myself in my head, but I have this, I guess it's self-talk, but it's, but it's continually going over God's word. And it's so peaceful. I sleep, when I do that, I sleep like a baby. And when I wake up, I'm refreshed, and I, I'm ready for whatever comes that day. That's, that's what we're talking about. Not my character, the character of God. I'm just kind of trying to share with you some of my experience. Hopefully, it's helpful to you. So, godly character is our goal. In 2 Peter, the first chapter, the first few verses there, uh, starting with verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. And that, that's what I was just talking about. When things are difficult, the best thing we can do is turn to God's word because that's where our peace is. And we need grace. Without grace, we'd be condemned, wouldn't we? We, have, we do not have the ability to make reparations for our sin. We can't clean, cleanse ourselves of, of sin. So we need grace. And we only get that through Christ. And so multiplied to you in knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So there is the godly life. Because God in his power, and there's no other power greater as we know. God can do anything with anyone. And so what this describes to me is that power of God has given to all of us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. So twice he mentions the word knowledge. Now this is not a knowledge that we use against somebody or to prop ourselves up to show how much we know. This is the knowledge that surpasses all knowledge of all things, and that is godly knowledge, God's Word. God's Word is where we get all spiritual blessings. All the power comes through that Word from God. So through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. We're going to be talking about Jacob in his life tonight. And those promises, those precious promises, remember that were made to Abraham, were passed on to Isaac, and then again were passed on to Jacob. Those precious promises, great promises that God has never failed in, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. What a wonderful blessing that is to be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Going down in the page, there's a whole list of things that we can add to our character. I'll just name these off because it's trying to uh, provide time for the other things I want to talk about. But the list is made up of these, faith, virtue, knowledge, as we've already mentioned in Peter's letter, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and last, love. We can face the nastiest of people if we have love. Because if, if God has filled our heart with love, we can face anybody because we're, 
We're showing love for them, are we not? And no matter what they try to pummel us with, our heart and our intent is to love that person. So that's the power of love. And all of these things that are mentioned here, brotherly kindness, it is all through love and God has taught us about love. We really didn't know love until we learned what God said is love. Some of the challenges of life that we face relate to things that Jesus was tempted by in Matthew 4. When Jesus tempted, I mean, I'm sorry, Satan tempted Jesus. And Satan said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. He was trying to trick Jesus into serving himself, wasn't he? He wanted Jesus to think of himself. And Jesus was having none of it. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the emphasis of, of what we're talking about tonight. And he goes on, this, Satan does, that is, that if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. So he was tempting Jesus to prove himself and to prove his power, trying to work on his pride, perhaps. And then... And then Satan said to him, uh, took him up on a high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. The ultimate goal for Satan is to get the Son of God to worship him. And Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only. And Satan left. Satan was not have any luck with with Jesus. And Jesus used God's word. A lesson again for us. Godly character comes from us using God's word in every aspect of our lives. So what would you say is the number one, and we're going to, we're going to read about this, this very thing in, in the, uh, Genesis, the 25th chapter, if you want to turn your Bibles to that. What is the number one stumbling block for all of us, no matter what our age? Selfishness. Exactly. Selfishness is the root of all things that war against it. It is, as somebody said, it is in our nature. I don't know if that's true or not, but you see it in the youngest of children all the way up to people older than I am. Pretty old. So, uh, it's very common, but as God's people, we are trying to grow in Christ. We're trying to represent him. We are trying to develop our character. And so we know the enemy is Satan, and selfishness is one of his best tools that he uses against us. So let's turn to uh, Genesis, the 25th chapter. Genesis 25. Jacob and his family, they all struggled with the same things that we struggle with. So let's look at them. Let's look at Jacob in particular. And let's see what it is. And let's talk about 
whether or not we face the same thing, and how can we deal with that? How can we deal with the situations that come up in their lives and in our lives as well? In verse 19, let's begin in verse 19 of chapter 25. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So it starts off well, doesn't it? Isaac is a godly man. He goes to God and pleads with the Lord to help his wife to conceive. It was quite a number of years that she went without conceiving, and so they were beside themselves. They wanted children. So Rebekah conceived, but there was a problem. In verse 22, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So in this case, the Lord actually spoke to Rebecca. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. What do we see right away that's kind of odd about what the Lord said to her? About the children. Kevin. Why is that odd? Exactly. So he's He's telling Rebecca that she has twins, which in that day, nobody knew what they were having, <laughs> boy or girl or more than one. And, and she found out that she was having two. And then she got more pertinent information about the children that a people would come from one and the older shall serve the younger. So, that must have worked on her mind, but it must have at the same time put her at peace, don't you think? That the trouble she was having with her pregnancy wasn't a bad thing, necessarily. It was a normal pregnancy, but maybe the two children weren't too normal. The Lord would speak to you and tell you? be pretty shocking too. <laughs> so, in verse 24, when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, he was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. So the oldest is Esau. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. So is that kind of out of the ordinary, too, that we see two twins that couldn't be more opposite, could they? If you were in the neighborhood and you notice the two boys, one is red and real hairy looking, probably a little bigger stature, I don't know. And Jacob stays around the house all the time and he's helping his mother and he's doing housework or things in the garden or whatever. And as he says later on, he has smooth skin. So wouldn't you think if you were in the neighborhood that you would think maybe the children came from two different parents maybe or something like that? Just, just a thought. But it's interesting that God would allude to Rebecca 
and I'm guessing that she shared this with Isaac, that the older would serve the younger. How would that work on their minds? So the word Jacob, the name Jacob, has two different name, uh, meanings, but we saw in the, in the text that it was, he's called a supplanter because he, he grabbed Esau's heel. It also means, could mean that he, he's a thief or a cheat. Also, it could mean that uh, he takes by the heel, literally. So those are the kind of things that the, the references I looked at. And then Esau, his name just means red and hairy, I think. At least hairy, the hairy part. Larry. Yeah, Larry makes a good point about the Lord is the one that's chosen Jacob, right? And I wasn't, I'm not sure I was aware about Abraham. Maybe I didn't notice that when I read it. But uh, certainly Ishmael would have been the, the firstborn, but not the promised one. And so Isaac was there. But very clearly, in this case, Esau was the firstborn. So just as normal parents, you would think that Esau would be the, the birthright. And certainly, Esau thought so. But he didn't think enough about it to take care. I'll, I'll just leave it at that until we read a little bit farther. But also, what were the parents... Do you remember what the parents said about the boys, Esau and Jacob? Rebecca liked Jacob. And Isaac liked or loved Esau. My thinking was that Esau provided for Isaac, and Isaac liked that. You know, it's the, the game because he was a hunter, and he was a he was a successful hunter. And uh, Jacob was the one that was always helping, in, in my vision of things, he's, he's always helping his mother around the house. He's always around the house. He works in the house and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the background behind those things. But we already see some problems in when the parents decide that they want to show favoritism to a child. We all recognize that to be problematic. And this does cause some problems, it would seem, as this goes on. But so the, the boys grow, and Esau comes in from hunting. Find my place here. In chapter 27, actually, I want to skip on to. Uh, chapter 27 and go into you let's just talk who who can tell us about the the stew that Esau wanted when he came back from hunting do you remember that I didn't hear you Esau's problem was that he was dead tired coming in from hunting and starving right and Jacob had made a stew. So 
What does Jacob do that shows his selfishness in this story, part of the story? Yeah, he makes a deal for the stew, doesn't he? And he buys the birthright. Well, I I took it that there was more, <laughs> but uh, obviously there was enough for for Esau. And that's that's the way I saw it. That he had just been making a a bunch of stew. I don't know. <laughs> it could have been just for him and his mother, but Esau seemed like uh, a person that doesn't really take things seriously, because he didn't take his birthright seriously, because he gave it up, didn't he? Jacob made him a deal, I'll give you the stew, but you give me your birthright, and Esau just he didn't really care. He just he just wanted something to eat. He wanted it now, but Jacob Jacob held it held him to it. You will give me your birthright, and he said, "All right, what is it to me?" So he gave him the birthright. So that was the first major thing that I can see that shows Jacob's selfishness, thinking of himself. There's a lot more that I thought of behind the scenes because maybe his mother spoke with him about what God told her, that Jacob would be the one, the chosen one, that Esau would not, that Esau would serve Jacob. Maybe he grew up with that kind of information from his mother. and He just kind of accepted that maybe birthright that his brother Esau was intended to get was really his. Not really sure. We're not, we're not told that, but certainly that, that might, if, if it was, it might have driven Jacob to be more selfish about it. Get him to admit it. Get Esau to admit admit to it. Yeah. Makes Jacob less manipulative. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> so, more importantly put ourselves in Jacob's place. How do we counter that? That's, that's more what I wanted to talk about. How do we counter our own selfishness even when we believe that we deserve it? This is mine, I deserve it. So don't mess with this, this is mine. You know, that, that kind of selfish attitude. So how do we how do we deal with that? How do we counter that? How do we push that out of our minds, put it under submission? Ask God, certainly. I understand where you're coming from, but I also want to caution in this way because we can pray fervently, God, change my mind. God, help me be submissive. Help me be giving, not taking. Help me, help me, to, help me to be selfless. We can pray fervently for that. But does it really... Does it get us to that goal? Kevin?
So let me see if I understand what you said. Could you, I have a hard time understanding people with a mask on, so I'm sorry, but keep your mask on. But um, you're saying that um, I think I think you're right, but you remind me again what you said. Right, right, right. Okay, you you just click the click the button, and now it came back to me. What I was thinking the same thing, Kevin, when when I was thinking about this lesson is we. We tend to think as human beings that there's a certain timetable for things, that, and this, this is the way they should happen. What perfect example, Larry talks about Abraham, what, what did he do? Wasn't it 20 years before Isaac was born, something like that? So Ishmael came first from the hand, handmaiden, right? Because Abraham wanted to make it happen. Is that what you're saying, Kevin? Yeah. Uh, we agree. Did you have some? So it's going to take work. It's going to take work, right? It's, it's going to take work. It doesn't just um, by osmosis. It, it, that's, that's not what it's about. Go ahead, Sam. This is interesting, Vance. Well, that's, that's certainly a possibility, but as we, as we get into the next case where they trick Isaac with all that situation, it does seem, because the mother, Rebecca, works with him, maybe that's where I got that idea, that maybe she perpetuated this idea as he was growing up. I, I don't know. We, we don't know. Go ahead, Larry. When
Probably not. But I think he does do much better, and I don't think we're going to get that far in this class. But I do, I do see some of your points, Larry, and I can agree with some of that. Um, but I do, I still think it's innate, it's nature, whatever it is. Selfishness, don't we all have to struggle with that? And um, wherever it comes from, it, it is, is something that we all have to deal with. And it can be destructive, as, as we see with Jacob and Esau, their relationship was completely blown apart. We'll try to get, let's, let's go ahead and turn to chapter 27. And... Chapter 27... And starting, yeah, verse, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out in the field and hunt game for me. Make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Give me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father, that he may eat it, and that he may bless you before, your, before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am sm a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to him to be a deceiver. So Jacob is a little reluctant to follow along with the plan. His conscience, perhaps, was working against him. So perhaps I will, be, I will be as a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse to, on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes from her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob. And then she put skins of the kids of the goats on his hands, on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave savory food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, My father. And his father said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your, your God brought it to me. Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near his, uh, uh, to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice of Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. 
Then he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank it. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of Esau's clothing and blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of the field in which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, my God, give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. He also had brought savory food to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat his son's game that your soul may bless me. And his father said to him, who are you? So he said, I am your son, firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate of it and before you came and have blessed him. Indeed, he shall be blessed. And Esau heard the words of his father and he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me also, O my father. And he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times, when he was born and now. He took away my birthright, and now he has taken away my blessing. Those are the two times. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master and all his brethren. I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained I have sustained him, what shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven and from above. By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father blessed him, and Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, then I will kill my brother Jacob. So Jacob has done this horrible deed it would seem, tricked his father, deceived him, got the blessing, and now he has ruined the relationship, whatever there was, with his brother. His brother is determined to kill him. So, because of the problems of what we as human beings suffer with, this has become the end of their relationship and their family. It hasn't done any good for the relationship between Isaac and his wife, Rebecca. And Jacob does go on and suffers himself in the future. But I wanted to I wanted to make mention of the fact that we, we see the character of Esau and we see how it's re- irresponsible is the best thing I can put on it. But we also see in the future for, Isaac, for Jacob that he becomes... The father of 12 tribes, doesn't he? The future of Israel comes from Jacob. 
And so some good turns for Jacob. He becomes responsible leader in this family. Teaches godly principles to his son. And what I'll read from Romans the ninth chapter kind of sums it up. In verse 13 of Romans 9, it says, As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That's pretty bad condemnation. Esau received from God. He hated Esau. But Jacob is in the Hebrew 11th chapter, a man of faith. So Jacob made good. He might have seemed like a rascal back when he was young. And we can talk about different aspects of why and what for. But I still think it boils down to overcoming the, the worldliness that is in all of us without God. And to honor God and to live our lives with godly character, we've got to go back to what I started out with. And we've got to develop these things that Peter talks about. The faith, the knowledge, virtue, self-control, perseverance, godliness, and brotherly kindness, and love. But we can only do it by turning at least daily to God's Word, so it's continually a part of our thought process. It becomes our heart, our mind. And trials. As we face trials, we put these things to work that God gives us. He promises that His power is behind us. We can do this. He created us for that purpose. and I think it's a wonderful blessing to know it, to know the tools that God gives us within this word and the brothers and sisters we have here with us to help support us, to help encourage us, to be there to lend a hand, to love us when we're not so lovable sometimes. Appreciate very much you listening to my ramblings and my comments about the class. And appreciate your comments as well. Hope you benefit from it. Uh, that's all we have. Uh, class is dismissed. You're very welcome. Randall and his family are here visiting with us, so hi, say hi to Randall.